right, okay, let's um, go right into this first lecture. And as I said in my introduction, I'll be doing five lectures, but this first one, the first one is in some ways is a review for a lot of you. This is the material that Dan Gibson put together in his book entitled The Early Islamic Qiblas, this book right here. And this is the material that by far has, I think, done probably more damage than anything else. This came out in 2017, so just three years ago. And because of his research, because of what he did between uh, well, 1979 and 2004, and continuing to do so even today. In fact, he's just been back from the Middle East where he's done and found some more mosques. Uh, he is asking a question that should have been asked by David King, Dr. David King, the world authority on the Qibla, when he was doing his research, but wasn't. And that's why uh, Dan Gibson had to do, uh, really had to cover or come behind him and find all these mosques that were facing the wrong way. But some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. So what I think I'll do is I'll go ahead and do a review. And for, so this first part of this lecture, it'll be three different distinct parts to this lecture, this first one on the Qibla. This first one will zero right into the Qibla and try to unpack it for you and try to explain it so that you can understand it, uh, so that in some ways you can then catch up with the with where we're going with this historical material. So it'll be on the Qibla, it'll be rather long, it's a little over an hour long, this first lecture. The second part of this lecture then will then go into Dan's newest material. Uh, now, there is, it's, it's hard to keep up with Dan because he keeps coming up with so much great material, much like Melon Murad. Uh, you, we have to keep one step behind him because he's always one step ahead of everybody else. So when I say newest, it's the newest that I am going to be introducing at this time. There is even more material that we'll be coming to and probably introduce, introducing probably in December and in January. And then the third part of this lecture, this would be uh, the debate between Dr. David King, who has been quite upset. And came up with this called the Petra Fallacy. Early mosques do face the sacred Kaaba in Mecca, but Dan Gibson doesn't know how. So we're going to go into the third area of this lecture and talk about that debate. And we're, I'm going to be unpacking it. I'm going to be looking at many of the claims that Dr. King threw against Dan Gibson in this paper, 54-page paper, and respond to them. Much of the material Dan Gibson has already responded to, I'll be adding to that, and giving my own viewpoint on the real problems, the the difficulties that Dr. King had and how he just did not understand what Gibson was all about. And there's a reason why we'll get into that in the third of part of this first lecture. So this lecture will be part A, part B, and part C. The Kibla to begin with, followed by the earliest material or the probably the most recent material that Dan is coming up with, and then this debate between King and Gibson. Now, you might say, hold on a minute. Why are we talking about Dan Gibson and why are we talking about the Qibla and why are we talking about Petra and, of course, Jordan, because Petra is in Jordan, when all this newest material that's been coming up that we've been putting up in the last two, three weeks has to do with Iraq? Or is there not a conflict between Iraq and Jordan? And no, there isn't. We, these are not conflicting. They are actually complementary and sequential. Let me just explain that. So before anybody starts getting upset with why am I talking about Jordan still when we've already moved over uh, to the east over to Iraq uh, in most of our uh, most recent uh, videos, Iraq is concerns politics and the Quran and also the theological debate. So there's completely different categories that we're talking about when we talk about Iraq. Whereas Petra and Jordan that we're gonna talk about today concerns really only the Qiblas and the direction of prayer of the, of the mosques. Therefore, Iraq both precedes Petra and returns following Petra. So when we get to Iraq, we'll see, and we'll be looking at from the, the years 577 to 636, that will be the last talk that we're going to talk about, and that will be when I look at the question for 
whether the quest, whether Muhammad existed, whether Islam existed, whether there were people called Muslims, whether it was a religion called Islam, whether it was a, a, a city called Mecca, or whether there was a book called the Quran. That will be in the last lecture. It will bring it tying in all of these other four lectures together in the last final lectures. And that's, those are the years 577 to 636. Petra are from the years 626 to 727. So we're talking about a different, totally different time period, and we're not talking about Islam. You'll see that. Petra has nothing to do with Islam other than the fact that it predates and pre gives us and moves us and is a nascent Quran or moves us into what later became Islam. Iraq then becomes important again from 736 and onwards, and that's why we're then going to return to it when we look at the Qurans and the Qiraats, because all of that takes place up in Iraq. And that's why it's fascinating that everything that I'm going to be talking about in these five lectures has to do with much further north and not with the Hijaz, not with that central area of Arabia where you find both Mecca and Medina, where supposedly all of Islam began, where supposedly Adam and Eve were sent to, where supposedly Abraham lived, and where supposedly this Kaaba has existed uh, since the time uh, of the very beginning. Can you see why this critique, this historical critique, is not based on the 9th and 10th century material, but on the 7th century and earlier? And then as we get into the Quran and as we get into how Islam was finally uh, yeah, initiated and began, we we'll then move back to the 8th, 9th, and 10th century and look and see what history tells us about that. So let's begin with the very first category and let's begin with the Qiblas. Now, to do that, we need to ask the question, what is the basis for Islamic history? Where do Muslims get their ideas concerning their own history, concerning their own beginning, concerning how their religion began? Now, they claim that 1,400 years ago, Muhammad did live. He existed at that time, uh, born in 570 and died in 632, and he was the last and the greatest of a whole line of prophets. He was the last of them. So the Quran was his revelation sent down only to him and is the final and greatest revelation. Islam, therefore, is the final religion based on Muhammad's life and sayings, that's the Sunnah, and on the Quran's teaching. Conclusion, therefore, everything that Muslims are dependent on really is dependent on one book and one man. I've said this many times, the book and the man, the book and the man. I think I've also, uh, my team in London actually copyrighted that phrase under my name. So I do own that phrase. So we should investigate both the Quran and Muhammad and see if indeed the Muslims are correct. And let's first study the, the look at Muhammad. Let's look at the emergence of Islam and let's, look, and let's go back to the seventh century. And let's first ask what we do know about, or what Muslims tell us about their man, Muhammad. And what they say is very simply, and you can see it there on the screen, that he was born in 570, received revelations in the Hira Cave in 610, and then received these revelations uh, uh, there in Mecca, the city of Mecca, uh, for uh, the next 12 years. During that time in 621, he was suddenly uh, was woken up, uh, and in the middle of the night, Jibril tells him to get on the back of a winged horse called the Burak, flies up to Jerusalem, and ascends the seven he heavens, and there he meets with God. Allah, and gets the 50 prayers, which he then dwindles down or brings him down to five prayers, running back and forth between Moses in the fifth heaven and God in the seventh heaven. That happens in 621. In 622, then, he then moves from Mecca up to Medina and known as the Hijra. Uh, then from 622 to 632, the last 10 years, we have what we call the Medinan revelations. He then conquered Mecca in 630, died in 632, at that time, the Quran had not yet been written down in a book form. Parts had been written down and much of it had been memorized. Abu Bakr comes to power and he rules for two years. He dies in 634. Then Umar uh, takes over. He rules for 10 years. He is killed. Uthman then takes over. He rules for 12 years up until 656. He is killed. Ali then takes over and he is the adopted son of Muhammad and he only rules for five years before he is killed up until 661. So from that period of 624 to 661 is the 
known as the Rashidun period, the period of the rightly guided caliphs. This is the golden age of Islam. And this is the Islam that all the Muslims on the right and the radical Muslims want to get back to. So that's the classical account. That's what you've all been told. That's what we've all been told. That's the only narrative that's out there. That's the only ever thing that I ever got uh, taught. I remember when I took my courses from you, Don, now this is what you taught back there in the 1980s. And I'm still sure that most people are still teaching this view. Why? Because where else are you going to go if this is the only thing they tell you? Well, let's take a look at a timeline and let's look and see what we're talking about. Look and see when all this material occurred. Remember, I started with 570 and I talked about his death in 632. You can go up until uh, the, the time that Ali was then killed in 661 if you want to. But that whole period that you see that's in the dotted red area, that's where all this period takes place. But hold on a minute. Where do we hear about all of this? Where does all this come into fruition? Well, the, the only place that we know where it comes to is from this period, from we could start with Ibn Ishaq in 765. However, we don't have his material, so we need to go with Ibn Hisham. And then we need to get his biography. His biography doesn't get written down for almost 200 years after the fact. His sayings, the Hadith, don't get written down for 240 years after the fact. His, uh, the, you might say the commentaries or the histories, these are the tafsir and the tahrik, they don't get written down until 923, which is 300 years after the fact. So let's put it on an easier timeline to look at. Here is Muhammad's death. He dies in 632. But everything we know about him, everything we're told about him, what happened, where he did, uh, where he lived, where he moved from, all the receiving of the Quran, all the events that happened in his life, first are written down by this guy here, Ibn Isaq. That's 765. But see, we don't have any of Ibn Isaq's material, nothing. What we do know about Muhammad's life comes from this man, Ibn Isham. He takes what he likes of Ibn Isaq, throws out most of it, and only retains what he considers to be authentic. So we can pretty well get rid of Ibn Isaq because we don't have anything to refer to. We only have what Ibn Hisham tells us existed at that time. Then after him comes al wakiri The two of them are credited with writing down what we call the Sirat Rasulullah, which would be the Sirat of the Prophet of Muhammad. And then you get Al-Buhari who introduces the Hadith. So he's the first to introduce his the Hadith. He dies in 870. Well, after him comes Sahih Muslim, who dies in 875. After him comes Abu Dawud, who dies in 899. Uh, they are the ones that are credited. There are more. There are three more, but I've just put those three up there because I'm going to run out of space. For those are the three most, the first earliest of the Hadith compilers, the sayings of the Prophet. And then you have Al Tabari, who's the first one to write down what we know as the Tafsir of the commentaries and the Tahrik, which would be the histories. So take a look at those dates. You notice there's a huge gap, don't you, between Muhammad and when they first appear, 200 years. For 200 years, nothing is written down that we can get our hands on. Now, you might say, okay, so that's, nonetheless, they use isnads, they use names. Uh, they use so-and-so who got it from so-and-so who got it from so-and-so who got it from the prophet, the companion of the prophet himself. Well, all these so-and-sos, they're all dependent on what we call oral tradition. And the problem with oral tradition, as you well know, and as I well know, they, it can be embellished. It can be accreted. It can be deleted. You can do this in a birthday party when you have kids who uh, you tell someone in one year or something, and they tell to the next person, and they tell to the next person. By the time it gets down to the 15th person, what the first person uh, says and what the 15th person says is two different things. We know that as Chinese whispers, or we call that also... Um, uh, telephone. I think that's the other name that's given for it. So you can see this is very much a practice that is used by quite a few. Uh, this is a problem that is brought up by quite a few people. And this is why I don't go with oral tradition, because oral tradition, by definition, is open to corruption. 200 years of oral tradition. You can imagine how it got embellished. You can imagine how it got deleted and accreted and how it got changed. And that's why when you finally hear what Muhammad said and did with his biography and with his sayings, they do not fit the seventh century. They do not fit what was actually happening on the ground. And that's why as historians, we need to go back to the seventh century. So here are the problems that the scholars are saying. Concerning these late dates, Islam, according to Humphreys, as we know it, did not exist in the 7th century, but evolved over a period of two to 300 years. He's referring to the fact that these don't even get written down until the 9th and 10th century. 
Rippon and Lester and Wansbur all say the Quran probably was not revealed to one man in 22 years, but likely evolved over a period of 50 to 100 years. The conclusion, the history of Islam, at least from the time of the Caliph Abdul Malik and before, is a later fabrication. So folks, can you see what we're dealing with here? We're talking about something that is based on nothing more than hearsay. And that's why the scholars are concerned. If so much of the his Islam's history was created so late, then why did it take so long to write it down? Remember, when we talk about the history of Jesus, when we look at what he did and what he said, when we look and see what, uh, what ex happened during his lifetime, where do we get it from? Do we get it from people that wrote it two to three hundred years later? No. Well, there are some people that, uh, that assume so, but we know we get it from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Who are these four characters. Well, three of them wrote their material within, uh, within 40 years of his death. The last one, John, wrote it within 60 years of his death. But the two of them were eyewitnesses to what they wrote. John and Matthew were actually there with Jesus for the last three years. They saw what he did. They heard what he said. And they wrote down what they saw and heard. The other two got it from the eyewitnesses. So you can see when we look at the history of Jesus and what he did, what he said, and where he went and where he lived, we can trust it because it's written by those who are right with him. The difficulty we have here, and this is why the scholars are concerned, is that everything that we know about Muhammad, everything we know about Mecca, everything we know about Islam, everything we know about these Muslims, and everything we know about the Quran, those five areas come not from people that were actually there watching it with their own eyes and hearing it with their own ears. They were getting it from 200 years later and finally writing it down. And so the next question is why did they write it down while they were living? Why did people who were there at that time actually write it down? Were they not literate? Listen, they controlled Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo by 642, and then from Spain to India, all the way from Spain to India by 685. Can, are you telling me that nobody between the country of Spain and India knew how to read and write there in the 7th century? Please. So where did they get this from? Where did the biographies get this material that they got it from? Well, they got it from nothing more than hearsay. Isnads, these muttons with a list of names after it from where they came. In one case, Al-Buhari, he was given 600,000 of these akhbars, and he was given the responsibility to throw out those which were fraudulent and keep those which were clear. And so he threw out 98% of it. Only 7,397 did he keep. That means he only retained 2%. This is an 870 in the late 9th century. How did he know what was authentic? How did he know what was fraudulent? He was writing 240 years after Muhammad had died. He was basically retaining only that which he fit his narrative, only that which fit the narrative of the Abbasids of which he was a part of. And we'll get into that in the fifth lecture, looking at the Abbasids and looking and seeing how Islam really was constructed and why it was constructed and why Muhammad was chosen and why Mecca was chosen and why the Quran was chosen or how it was even put together. So can we trust it? No, I would say absolutely not. I do not want to hear people just keep quoting about what the 9th and 10th century biographers and hadith writers and tafsir uh, compilers said. I don't care about them anymore. I've said this many times, you've heard me, because they are much too late and they are much too far away. They're hundreds of uh, miles away and hundreds of years later. Therefore, we need to go back to the 7th century. We need to go back when this all took place. As any historian worth their salt, that's what every historian does. They go back to the 7th century, and we need to find out what happened there. So what are they finding? In a lot of the material that I'll be using in these next five uh, talks, I'll be zeroing in on many of these scholars that you see on the screen there. Wandsboro, uh, out of School of Our Oriental and African Studies. He was the one that really blew this all open when he came up with two books in the 1970s called Quranic Studies and Sectarian Milieu. Both of them very difficult to read. Unless you know an awful lot of history and an awful lot of foreign languages, you're going to have a hard time pouring through it. He's very technical, and that's why he is so well known. But he was the first one to say everything we know that we see written on this book called the Quran, everything we see here, a lot of the stories in this book of the Quran, the one I have in my hand here, could not have been written in the 7th century in a place called Hijaz, where we find Mecca and Medina. They couldn't have been that far south because most of this material is written, comes from documents that were much, much further north. Ooh, I love that. Much, much further north. 
primarily from Iraq, from Stesiphon, the archaic name, the ancient name for what is today Baghdad, from that area. And he was vilified for saying this, but he just looked at textual criticism, looking over at the, the stories and showing where the roots are and showing where, uh, where the earliest documents we have for them, and they did not exist that far south nor that early. Dr. Gerald Hawking that I studied under, he was the one that has written most on the first century of Islam, and it was great to be his student at that time. Dr. Patricia Corona, who is a friend of mine, I got to know her uh, when she was at Cambridge University. She used to be at Oxford, wrote a book called Hagarism, and then another book called Meccan Trade and the Rise of Islam in 1987, got death threats for what she found there. But see, this woman, this woman reads and writes 15 languages, all archaic language. You cannot dispute her on that account. And that's why she is so devastating, because she understands what she's reading. She is one of the few in the world that can really take on this material because she's going to the original documents. She's going back to where they were written, which is what every historian should do. Now, in her case, she's a linguist. And so when I did my first debate uh, 25 years ago, 1995, with Dr. Jamal Badawi, I went up to her office and we spent the whole afternoon and she gave me 10 historical questions. Many of them are the same questions I'm asking today. 10 historical questions concerning Muhammad, concerning Mecca, concerning the whole emergence of Islam, the material that I'm even working on and that I'll be introducing in these five lectures. She was the one that actually introduced this material. And this was in 1995, I got it from her. And so I said, well, why don't you do this debate? And she said, I am an academic. I have a chair that I have to protect. You aren't, you're nothing more than a missionary. You can say and do and go anywhere you want. You have the freedoms I don't have. Plus you can use this much more quickly and, um, and be able to turn it around much faster than I can do it. So I did the debate, but she did the research. Dr. R. Andrew Rippon, he, um, he is one that, uh, that has probably taken a lot of this very difficult material and put it down into layman's terminology. Muslims, Their Beliefs and Practices is a great book. If you don't have it, get it and read it and you'll see where he takes and shows us how Islam had to evolve uh, much, much earlier than what we are giving credit for. Dr. Robert Hoyland is another academic. He is from Oxford University. He reads and writes 18 languages. And uh, I think I have his book right here somewhere. Seeing Islam as Others See It, right there. Hoyland's book right there on my shelf. By the way, these are all the books I'm going through right now. If they're going this way, that means I'm in the process of reading them. If they're this way, I haven't yet got to them. So this is all the stuff I'm working to, to with, for these lectures that I'm using for the next five weeks. So Robert Hoyland is the one that has probably the one that, that I've really enjoyed the most because he has actually done what has done us a great favor and taking all these very difficult documents in all these different languages that only he knows. Well, Dr. Patricia Kroner and he know. And then he is translating them and interpreting them and then giving us, putting it out there so that we can come to our conclusions on them. Dr. Yehuda Neville uh, out of Jerusalem, he is the one that's credited with going back and looking at the earliest inscriptions, the rock inscriptions, and just deciphering them and then making and showing the impact that came from them. And his book's right here on Crossroads to Islam, the blue one. Maybe I should hold it up to you. Uh, so that's the one that, that, uh, where you can use that. And then the German scholars are who have been probably foremost at looking at the difficulties with the chronic manuscripts and the earliest manuscripts. And that's Dr. Gunter Luning, Dr. Uh, Puin, Dr. Von Bothmer, and Dr. Oleg. They're the ones that we'll be getting into and be using when I get into the chronic material in about four weeks. So let's go ahead and let's talk about what they found. Well, concerning early Islam, and this is probably the, the um, this is fascinating because I'm going to give you the conclusions before even I go through and I give you, show you how they came to those conclusions. But let's just go through these five conclusions that they've come up with. Number one, the first Arab inscription referencing Muhammad is not till 691. Now that in and of itself is disturbing. That's 60 years after he died. No one seems to know about him and no one seems to have written about him and no one seems to have talked about him. And yet if he's this important and he is the center of, and he is the, the one that from which all this final revelation in Islam is birthed, why is it no one seemed to know about him? Now we're going to talk about those references that do refer to him and we're going to show you that they do refer to someone named Muhammad, but is it this Muhammad? But that's for a later week. The first reference to the word Muslim, these people called Muslims, is not till the 690s. 
So what did they call themselves? Well, they used to call themselves Saracens, which is the name that many of the Westerners give them, the Hagarim. That means they are from the line of Hagar, Ishmaelite, from the line of Ishmael, who comes from Hagar. Uh, they call themselves Magre because they are from the Maghreb, and they are called themselves Mahajurun. These are the people of the Hijab, the people of the Exodus. They are nomadic. They move from one place to another. So what is that Hijab? We'll be getting into that later on. The first reference to the word, the name Islam is not found, uh, is not found until the Dome of the Rock in 691, built in 691 by Abd al-Malik. The first reference to Mecca, this is the big one. The first reference to Mecca is not till 741 on the Continuato Byzantia Arabica. That's not till the mid eighth century. Yet this is where Islam began. This is where really humanity began. This is where Adam and Eve were set to in chapter seven, verse 24. This is where Abraham lived in chapter 21, verse 51 to 71 of the Quran. If this is the oldest city in history, why is it there's no reference of it until the mid eighth century? And the first biography of Muhammad, as I said earlier, does not get written down until 833, 200 years too late. Now, what we wanna do next is to talk about Mecca. We're gonna talk about Mecca here. We're gonna talk about the Qibla, but to do before that, we've got to talk about Mecca. And I have three problems with Mecca. The first problem it's the one, is the problem with geography. <clears throat> when you look, and this is a, comes out of a book that, that Dan Gibson wrote called Quranic Geography. If you don't have it, get it. If you don't want to pay for it, you can get it on PDF uh, by just paying $15 online. Go up to Dan Gibson's site uh, and just order it. It's a great book to have. It was written in 2011. Uh, a little bit out of date, but it, the material in it, the great thing about it, because it's historical, it's talking about history, that never goes out of date. And what he noticed uh, when he looked at the Quran, and he's been studying it for 25 years, uh, he noticed that there were 65 geographical references, but only nine were named. And the three that come up more than any other are the word Ad, which is the name for the people of Uz, the biblical Uz. And that was found 23 times in the Quran. Uh, there also comes up over and over again the name for Thamud, who are known as, that's what we would know as the Nabataeans. That's found 24 times in the Quran. And the name Midian, uh, we were the Midianites. That's found seven times in the Quran. Now, what's fascinating, to take a look and see where these three places are. Look at the map there on the right, and you'll see Ad, Thamud, and Midian are way up north. They're way up in what is today Jordan and real close to Petra. They should be down south in Mecca. If this prophet was having this contact with these people from these three areas on a daily basis, how could he go up 600 miles to see them unless he had a helicopter? So you can see that the problem immediately shows itself that there are some geographical difficulties with the Quran concerning uh, a, it taking place or existing in the city of Mecca. What's more, when you look on a map, now this is a, facsimile of a Byzantine map from the seventh century. And you notice what's missing. You can see where the question mark is. Those are the trade routes. Here's another picture of the trade routes from the seventh century. What's missing again? It's right where the question mark is. That's where Mecca is. Mecca is not on these trade routes. Here's an official map from the sixth century. Where's Mecca? Mecca just doesn't exist on this map. Here's another map from the seventh century. You notice Mecca doesn't exist on this map either. Take a look at this map. Here's another seventh century map. You notice Mecca is not there. Where is Mecca? Should be on all these maps. One more map from the seventh century. Mecca is just non-existent. On any of these maps, you won't see Mecca. Now, let's go back to Montgomery Watt. Dr. Montgomery Watt in the last, uh, Watt in the last century tried to understand why Mecca was important. And he said the reason for its importance had to do with what was happening historically in the seventh century. And he mentioned that all the trade that was coming from the East, so it's coming from China and India and places like that, had to come to India to the West Coast. So you can see the West Coast. And this is a map, I'm giving, I'm, I should have said, this is a map uh, from the seventh century. So this is what it would look like in the seventh century. So you can see Stesiphon, it still is made, named there where Baghdad should be. 
And so this is uh, his theory, that the trade used to come across from the west coast of India because of the Hindu Kush and because of the Himalayas, it couldn't go up north. So they had to bring the trade to the west coast of India. And they took it from the west coast of India across the Arabian Sea, up through the Persian Gulf, and then across through what is today uh, Iraq and then Syria over to the Mediterranean world because they had to get it to the Mediterranean world. So that was the trade route. Then the Sassanians and the Byzantines started warring with each other in the fifth century and on the sixth century up until the seventh century. So because of this conflict that was going up north there, that shut down the Persian Gulf. So the trade could no longer go that route because there was too much warfare going on. So there was a dilemma. Montgomery Walk said, that the way to solve that was to go, therefore, redirect the trade this way over to Aden, down here in the southern part of Arabia, and then send that trade straight up through Arabia up to Gaza in the north. So here's the first problem, however. Aden, and this is what you can see, this is where Patricia Krona saw this difficulty right away. It's, in fact, this is her, this really is uh, in her book, Me Mech and Trade and the Rise of Islam. This is her argument. Take a look and let's look at that trade that goes up on the Western Plateau. Starts at Aden, goes up through Nadal and Sana, goes up to Taif. And then from Taif, notice it comes down off the plateau, down to Mecca, which is about a thousand meters off. Now it looks like, on this map, it looks like Mecca is on the coast. It's not on the coast. It's about 50 miles in from the coast. It's just that's where they had to ride it. And then from here, it then had to be go back up to the western plateau to Yathrib and then continue up to Gaza in the north. And she says, hold on a minute, take a look at that map and you will see that there's a deviation there. It should not be on the trade route. What's more, why would you go to dive, come down a thousand meters, then go back up to Yathrib and continue on. And so that's why she decided to do some research on Mecca. And she then wrote her book of her findings, Mecca and Trade and the Rise of Islam in 1987, where she looked at what all the Muslims have been saying, what the traditions say, and even what Montgomery Watt was saying, and that is that Mecca became important because of all the spices, 15 spices that it controlled. She went back through and did a survey on every one of those 15 spices and found that not one of those spices went up the Western Plateau. The only place in Arabia that even had any spices was way down around the southern part of Arabia called the Hadramat, but where Yemen and Oman is today, and that was frankincense and myrrh. The other spices all came from, from Africa. Africa, over there on the west. None of them were in Arabia. Arabia was not a country known for spices, and certainly there's no reference in any of these trading documents for any place called Mecca at all. Remember, she went back to the trading documents. So she came up with another theory. Because of this problem here, she came up with this theory. Well, let's go ahead and bring the trade down to what the Montgomery Watt thought was Aden. But he says, no, he didn't stop at Aden for one very good reason. Take a look at the map. Where do you see she is going? Well, take a look at the Red Sea. There's a waterway that goes up the west coast of Arabia. Why in the world would you stop and unload your goods in Aden? Because she found out if you unload your goods in a city called Aden, and you go 50 miles by land, it would cost the same amount as going 1,250 miles by sea which is the length of the Red Sea there. It would be the same cost. It would be prohibitively expensive to take any goods by land. And so she went back to the trading documents as what a historian should do, what Montgomery Watt should have done. And she went and looked at all the documents and looked at the receipts. And she found that the name that came up over and over and over again was this name, Agilis, the city of Agilis, which is today in Eritrea. That's the city that comes up over and over again with all the trading re uh, receipts, proving that all the trade was maritime. It did not go across the Arabian uh, Peninsula for it would have been too expensive, and it certainly did not have a deviation going down to Mecca. It remained always on sea. We do that even today. If you look at all the big ships that are going across the world, why is it they put almost of our goods on ships? Because it's the cheapest way to go. Uh, in the old days, you could use the wind. It didn't cost you a thing. And in the course, if you're taken by land, you have to have camels. You have to feed the camels. You have to protect the camels. You have to protect your goods. And that's why you then have to have oases about every day's length walk. And that's why it's so difficult to go across the deserts by land, but not by sea. You can go anywhere by sea. It is free. It is open. But it is easy and it is cheap. Now, the other problem 
with Mecca is the wrong references to it. There's only one reference to it in the Quran at all. The entire Quran only has one reference to Mecca, and it's in chapter 48, verse 24. And there you can see it listed there. And he it is who hath withheld men's hand from you and hath withheld your hands from them in the valley of Mecca after he had made your victors over them. So it doesn't really say much about it. And that's the only reference in the Quran for the city. What's more, notice it says it's in the valley, in a valley. Well, what we also know about this place where the prophet lived. And remember, every time it talked about where this prophet lived, it mentioned that, that the place of the prophet or the uh, the uh, environment of the prophet. And it refers a lot of things to where he lived. It says that according to Ibn Isaac and Al-Buhari that it's in a valley and it has a parallel valley. According to Al-Buhari that it has streams going through it. According to Surah 37, it says that it's outside are the ruins, the pillar of salt, referring to the wife of Lot. In Al-Buhari, it talks about it has fields. According to Sahih uh, Tirmidhi and Buhari and also Tabari, it has trees, grass free and clay and loam. And then according to Surah 6, 141 and also 16 and Surah 80, it has olive trees with mountains overlooking the Kaaba, according to Ibn Ishaq and Al-Buhari. But when you look at Mecca, it does not have a valley or a parallel valley. There's no streams going through it. Outside the ruins, there's not a pillar of salt. It does not have fields, trees, grass, fr fruit, or clay alone. And it certainly does not have olive trees. There are no olive trees outside of the Mediterranean. The only place where olive trees grow is in the Mediterranean, and that's 600 miles further north. So none of these listed above make sense for Mecca because it's much too arid and much too dry. The third problem is the Qibla. If Mecca is wrong, then the Qibla is going to be wrong. Now remember, the Qibla is the direction of prayer. And this is where all Muslims pray today. They all pray towards Mecca. Chapter 2, verse 143 to 150, it says that the direction of the Qibla was changed. Most, people, most uh, Muslims say that this happened in 624, but it doesn't say where. It doesn't say where it was changed to. So archaeology does support this change but not from Jerusalem to Mecca, as Muslims suggest, but someplace further north and much, much later. So where is it? Well, back in 1905, two scholars, Dr. Creswell and Dr. Fehrabadi, were going to old or ancient mosques, two in what is today Iraq and one in what is today Egypt. And they were going to these old mosques, uh, one outside, uh, one in Masjid, which is the mosque in, uh, not too far from where is today Kufa, and the one that close to it called the Kufa Mosque. So you have both of these two mosques. They dug their uh, dug down to the original floor plans. And when they got down to the original foundations of these mosques, they found that the Qibla, the original Qiblas of these mosques, were facing west. They went outside of Cairo and they went to the garrison town of Fustat, which is in Egypt. And they noticed that that mosque that was dated to 641, when they read, well, down, went to its original floor plans, they noticed the Qibla, the direction of the of prayer, was facing east. Let's look at a map and see what I'm talking about. So there you have Wasit and Kufa, there in the Mediterranean, I'm uh, sorry, uh, it, between the Euphrates and the, and the Tigris rivers in the Mesopotamia, are facing west in the seventh century. The one in Egypt is facing east, but they should be facing south. So in 1905, they saw that there was a problem and they just thought, well, they were facing Jerusalem. And I remember when I did a debate in 1998 with uh, Abdul Green, I brought this up and I pointed this out. And he says, Jay, you're completely wrong. Look at the Wasat Mosque, look at the Kufa Mosque, look at those original Qiblas and they are not to Jerusalem at all. You're three to five degrees off. And I thought, oh, okay, well, he knows something I don't know. I wasn't aware of that. That was in 1998 I did that debate. I wish I'd had Gibson's work back that time because if you look and see where three to five degrees are off, that is true. They aren't facing Jerusalem. I thought they were facing Jerusalem. We'll, we'll see what Dan Gibson finds out and we'll find that that three and the five degrees puts it directly to Petra. We have also documentary evidence, Jacob Odessa in 688, some say it's 705, nonetheless, it's in around that time period, refers and says that from, from all this, it is clear that it is not to the south that the Jews and the Maghre, the Maghre would be the Arabs, here in the Sy regions of Syria pray, but towards Jerusalem or the Kaaba, the patriarchal places of the races. So he didn't have, he didn't have uh, GPS to help him. So he thought that the reason they were facing west and they were facing east is because they were facing Jerusalem, as I thought in my 1998 debate. Little did I know that with GPS coordination, you can get a lot more accurate uh, telemetry. And of course, he was saying this 
in the late seventh century, early eighth century, as late as that, as sorry, as early as that, I should say, he actually got it right. But why were they not facing south? Well, what we need to do is we need to go to Dan Gibson because he is the one that has done the germinal work on this. And he is the one that from 1979 to 2004, that's for, for 25 years, he did his formal research on the giblets. Now he's still continuing with this. He's still going back to the Middle East. He's still going back to these countries and he's still finding old mosques. He didn't plan to do this. He happened on a number of mosques and he was looking at their kiblas and he noticed that none of them were facing Mecca. So he decided to do some more research. And as a result, he went to over a hundred mosques. And uh, there's a picture of Dan Gibson. And I just want to show you his books that he came out with. I already showed you Quranic Geography. Now uh, this one here, which you can get online. Uh, the Nabataeans is the one that he started with. And this is the first book he wrote. He actually wrote this as a tourist guide. It was written for the government of Jordan. And he did it uh, on, under commission. But as he was looking into the Nabataeans, he noticed that the Nabataeans actually have an awful lot to say concerning how Islam began. And we'll be coming to that at a later time. But the, mo the book that probably did the most da damage was this book. Uh, this came out in 2017. So it's only been out three years. Get it. It's very colorful. It has lots of pictures inside and it's full of data, full of material, full of interesting, uh, not only just interesting, but exciting, exciting material that completely confronts this notion that Mecca was the center of Islam or that Mecca was even the center of the Qiblas. So let's look at his findings. For some of you, this is review. For others, this is new. So I'm not going to go into all of it. I'm just going to do a quick snapshot so that you can get up to speed because we want to get into the new material next. So when you look at his mosques, uh, you can also go up on his site, Dan Gibson's, uh, just go up and put it in on YouTube and look at the Sacred City, which is the documentary on his findings. He noticed that all the mosques that he found up until 706, so every mosque up until the 8th century, up until 706, and he was looking from 624 all the way up to 706, 17 mosques that he's been able to uncover. Every one of them, from Medina, Guangzhou in China, Cherman in India, Jami al Hamair, Al Kabir in Syria, the Fustat in Egypt, the Dome of the Rock in Israel, the Humayna Mosque in Jordan, Amman Mosque in Jordan, uh, the Grand Sana Mosque in Yemen, the Kirbat al Minya uh, of Israel, just to name a few. Every one of them are facing Petra. Not Mecca, not Medina, not Jerusalem, but Petra. Up until 706, there is not one mosque facing Mecca. Here is the coordinates. There you can see Petra. Look how accurate they are. All of the 17 Petran Qiblas before 706, except for two, fall within 45 mile dotted circle, proving how accurate they were. Now remember, these are Qiblas that are coming away from as far away in the east, this direction, as far away as the Guangzhou Mosque in China as far away as the Sherman Mosque in Kerala. Johnson, that's your area. And yet they were all facing Petra. Not one is facing Mecca in the, in the seventh century or the early eighth century. So there's the first Petra Mosque. Just take a look at how far away they are and yet how accurate they were. Then there was a second Qibla that was introduced. And this is what he called the between Qibla. And if you take a line from Petra to Mecca and take the halfway mark, that's where all these mosques were facing. They start to appear in 706 in the 8th century, and they go up till 772. Why were they facing in between? There's nothing there. There's no city there. There's no building there. There's no mountain there. There's not even a rock there. It's just sand. So why are they facing that point? We're going to answer that. Hold on. And then he finally came across Mecca and Qibla. In fact, the first one that faces Mecca is not till 727. Remember, Muhammad died in 632. The Qibla was canonized in 624. And yet, we don't find any mosques facing Mecca until 727. That's over 100 years later. Over 100 years later. And then by 876, every mosque is then facing Mecca until today. But that's too late. That's much too late. The fourth Qibla is what he knows he calls the parallel Qiblas, which are all the mosques in North Africa and also in Spain. They're all facing a, a line that is parallel to Petra and Mecca. They're not facing Mecca. They're not facing Petra. They're facing a line parallel. What's going on here? We'll answer that. Hold on. 
So which were the most accurate Qiblas? Modern scholars believe that the, the variety of Qibla directions were due to the inability of the ancient Arabs finding an accurate Qibla direction. Modern scholars simply quoted earlier Islamic scholars concerning this theory. They assumed that the Meccan Qiblas were more accurate. Now with a much more accurate GPS technology, we know that the earliest Arabs had the most accurate Qiblas. Take a look at this graph. This is from, uh, from his book. So which is the most accurate? Take a look and you will see that the most accurate were the between ones. They were less than a degree off in accuracy. The second most accurate were the Petran Qiblas, 2.9 degrees of accuracy, 1.9 if we take away the worst two. The next most accurate would be the parallel Qiblas. They were 3.5 degrees of accuracy, but the worst ones, the ones that were the least accurate were the Meccan Qiblas, uh, 4.78, which debunks that whole theory that the Meccans knew their material better because they had better math mathematics. Not at all. And we'll talk more about that when we get into this debate between King and Gibson. Now, why Mecca? What's the significance? Well, it was a sanctuary for the Nabataeans between the second century BC up until 713. And it was also the sanctuary for the Umayyads between 661 and 749. The first uh, uh, empire, uh, Islamic empire, although we're gonna debunk that as well. Remember the Nabataeans are absolutely important because they are the ones that give us what we now do today as Arabic. And they also give us the name Allah and Alat, which we'll talk about later. But what's fascinating is Mecca is missing, but Petra is in these maps. Remember these maps I showed you before? Mecca is not there, but Petra is there. In every one of these maps, take a look and you will see. In fact, let's go back to that one there. Can you notice it's at the center of the trade? Both these maps that are the trade routes map, Petra is at the center of the trade. It's not there in this map, but Petra is. Mecca is not there in this map, but Petra is. So in every one of these maps, Petra is very well known. And it's important, is very clear, because when you go to Petra, if any of you have been there, you will see it has these beautiful carved buildings, which is a city of tombs and temples. Tombs and temples for who? For the Nabataeans. What's more, Petra has the vegetation that we find in the Quran and the traditions. Note where Petra is and what it has. It's in a valley. Look at the map on the right. You can see it's in a valley with a parallel valley, which supports Ibn Isak and al Buhari. It has a stream. al Buhari talks about it. It has more than one stream. Outside its ruins are the pillar of salt. If there was to be a pillar of salt that was known, it would be right outside of Petra. It has fields, according to al Buhari. It, the place of the prophet, not Becca, it doesn't say the, the name, but it is the place of the prophet, which has trees, grass, fruit, clay, loam. All of them are there in Petra. Most importantly, it has olive trees. The thing you need to have is olive trees, and there you find it in Petra, with mountains overlooking the Kaaba. Petra has all the items listed above from both the Quran and traditions. Thus, could Petra be the place that they are all referring to? Also, as I said earlier, it's where the people of Ad, the people of Thamud, and the people of Midian are. So all these people who are there uh, with having contact with this prophet from that place, they're all right around there. They're all within, within uh, striking distance. In fact, that would make sense then that this prophet uh, from this place would have all kinds of contact with them. Why? Well, because he is right next to them. No helicopter needed there. Now, historical significance. Why then was Petra important? Well, to do that, you need to ask what was really happening. And here's a possible scenario. Now, I put September 2020 because I could change this within another year. This is the, this is the exciting thing and also one of the problems of historical criticism. You have to go with what comes to the fore. You have to go with where the evidence takes you. So here in September 2020, this is what we're saying. To make sense of all this, we will need to begin with Abdullah ibn Zubair, uh, the governor of Petra under Abdul Malik the Umayyad Caliph from 685 to 705. He is there in Petra and he gets disillusioned. He gets upset with the Umayyads who are way up further north, way up in Damascus. So he rebels against the Umayyad power. He rebels against the father of Abdul Malik and also against um, Abdul Malik himself. And he leaves uh, Petra. What's fascinating, the question needs to be asked is why is it that they were, were way up in Damascus. Why, if they were the first Muslims, why weren't they down in Medina or Mecca, the Hijaz, which was the birthplace of Islam? What are they doing way up in Damascus? No one's really answered that question. 
So he rebels against him, starts the Second Civil War, and destroys the Kaaba in Petra. And then he flees Petra, the Zubair, and he takes the Black Stone. Hugely important. No one's looked at the Black Stone. The Black Stone is on the Kaaba today. Now, it's not one stone anymore. It's been broken up, and it has about seven or eight little pieces. If you look at it carefully, inside this big piece of tar, that's why it's black still today. So this black stone is taken by him. To understand why the black stone is important, we're going to get into it possibly in another four weeks. You need to do a historical survey of the black stone. It is a hugely significant stone for the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans were the ones that, that controlled the black stone. They knew about the black stone because they believed wherever the black stone was, God's presence was there. So whenever the black stone leaves, God's presence leaves with the black stone. So when Zubair takes the black stone with them and flees Petra, he takes God's presence out of Petra. And he flees down to the south. We aren't told where he flees to. Perhaps Mecca. It looks like that that's where he ends up. Now, he needs allies, and so he uses the Abbasids, who are up there in Stesiphon, uh, what is today Baghdad, and they are also in control of Kufa, and they join the rebellion and support Zubair. Now, let's just take a look and put it on a map so you can understand what I'm talking about. That is Damascus there that I just circled in black, and that is the political capital of the Umayyads, and according to uh, what we now know historically, that that was, has been the capital since Muawiyah really created as his capital in 661. He is the beginning of the Umayyad dynasty, which is fascinating because we can't find anything about uh, <laughs> Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, the four rightly guided kids. We can't find any reference to them outside of the traditions. Isn't that interesting? So we do know about Muawiyah. There's an awful lot. We're going to talk about him next week quite a bit. And he's living up there in Damascus. Why is he not living way down in Mecca? So. His sanctuary is Petra. All of the Nabataeans' sanctuary is Petra, and so are the Umayyads. They are there in Petra. That's where, they're, that's where they pray toward. That's why all these mosques that Gibson has found are facing Petra. Baghdad up here, it says Stesiphon because this is a seventh century map. It then changes its name to Baghdad later on. But let's just say Baghdad today so we can know what we're talking about. Baghdad is where the Abbasids were centered. And they hate the Umayyads. They want nothing to do with the Umayyads. They then ally themselves with Zubair and they make Mecca their sanctuary. Down here, circled in purple. So there you have the two political headquarters, circled in black. And then you have the two sanctuaries, the golden one in Petra and the purple one in Mecca. Can you then understand we have two empires that are vying with each other, opposing each other, one who is in power on the west and the other one who wants to be in power in the east? Now, this is why you need to look at the political context. While this is going on, Abdul Malik, who is the Umayyad Caliph and ruling from 685 to 705 in Damascus, he needs to have this Arab identity. For 40 years now, they have controlled uh, the the Hijaz, but they've also by that time, by the time he comes to power, they now have all the way from Andalusia, which is Spain in the west, all the way to India in the east is now under his control. That whole swath of land is under control. Now, what's interesting is the, the, in order for him to run these cities, and a lot of the cities were then controlled by Jews and Christians because they were much more literate than the Arabs. The Arabs were mostly nomadic. And that's why they use the Jews and Christians. They call them Maulas or Mawalis. And for 40 years, they have been using the Jews and Christians to run their cities for them. But here's the problem. The Jews and the Christians, they had a prophetic line. The Arabs did not have a prophetic line. The Jews and the Christians had an identity because they also had a scripture. The Arabs did not have a scripture. <clears throat> they needed to have a prophetic line and they needed to have a scripture. <clears throat> what are you going to do? That's where Abdul Malik decides to do something about it. So what did he do? Well, when you look and see, the first thing he did uh, was to go to Jerusalem and build this enormous structure called the Dome of the Rock in 691. Why in the world would he build that in Jerusalem? Why didn't he build that in Mecca? Why didn't he build that in Medina? Why didn't he build that in Damascus where he lived? Why in Jerusalem? Well, take a look at where it's built. It's built up on the hill overlooking the Church of the Sepulchre. So there's the Dome of the Rock, and there's the Church of the Sepulchre down there. It looks down on top of the Church of the Sepulchre. What's the significance of the Church of the Sepulchre? That was the sanctuary for the Byzantine Christianity, the, the great superpower of its day, the biggest authority and also the biggest competition 
that Abd al-Malik had against him. Here you can see the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is built in 709, later on, after Abd al-Malik. Uh, it was built during the time of his son, Abd uh, al Walid. But certainly you can see immediately why this is important. So he employs Byzantine architects to build and uses Byzantine architecture. It's much larger and more prominent than any other building of its day. And it sits above the Church of the Sepulchre. It's situated in the holiest city for Jews and Christian. That's why it's non-Damascus or Mecca. Now, when you talk to a Muslim, they'll say it was built to commemorate the Miraj, the night journey from Muhammad, going from Mecca up to Jerusalem and going up through the seven heavens to meet Allah. That's what they say was built. But let's look and, and see if that is so. Let's look at the inscriptions. Now, when you look at the Dome of the Rock, it has been destroyed and rebuilt 11 times. The only original part of the Dome of the Rock is where those two green arrows are, the two ambulatories. That's the only original part of the building. Everything else has been built around it and above it since the seventh century, since 691. In fact, the structure that we're looking at today was rebuilt in 1876. That's a little over 100 years ago. So it's very new. So you have to go back to the earliest structure, those two ambulatories, those two circular uh, octagonal uh, arches that you see where the two green arrows are. And you need to look at the inscriptions. You need to look at the Arabic inscriptions that are there along those ambulatories. Now, what do they say? Well, you will notice that they are Quranic. They are Quranic references, yet they all attack the Trinity and Jesus' divinity. Isn't that interesting? Chapter 4, verse 171. O people of the scripture, do not exaggerate in your religion, nor utter aught concerning Allah save the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah, and his word which he had conveyed unto Mary, and a spirit from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers, and say not three, cease. It is better for you. Allah is only one God. For is it removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son? Well, who is that attacking? Well, it's attacking Jesus' divinity, it's attacking the Trinity, and it's attacking that he is the Son of God. So it's attacking those three things. Chapter 17, verse 111 is also up there. Praise be to God, who hath not taken unto himself a son. There again, it's attacking his sonship. And who hath no partner, it's attacking the fact that Jesus could have a partner. That's in chapter 5, verse 72 also. And in the sovereignty, nor hath he any protecting friend through dependence. He's not dependence on it. He's above every one of us. So you can see that is attacking the person of Jesus Christ. And then we get to Surah 112. There is no God but God. There is the beginning of the Shahada. He is one. He has no associates. That's not part of the Shahada today. So what's that doing there? Well, it's obviously, it's attacking about that Jesus would be the associate of God. This is Byzantine Christianity. It's attacking their theology. It's attacking his divinity. Say, he is God, the one God, the eternal besought of all. He begetteth not, nor was begotten. Again, that's attacking John 3, 16. The Jesus, the begotten son of God. And there is none comparable to him. And then Muhammad is the messenger of God. Now, there is much dispute as to whether or not that is Muhammad the man, or that is just the praised one is the messenger of God. Could this also be referring to Jesus as the messenger of God? Who knows? We don't know. But I would suggest that we need to at least bring that up there as a possibility. So you can see, look at these verses. These are nothing to do with the Miraj. There's not one reference about Muhammad going up to the seven heavens or about him coming on the Borak, the winged horse. There's nothing on the original inscriptions about that event, the Miraj. So when Muslims say that that was why that building was built, I would suggest they look at these inscriptions and see why it was built and where it was built. It was built there for a reason to confront the whole notion of who Jesus is, his divinity, the Trinity, and his sonship. Those are the four areas that, we, that stand against everything we believe about Jesus Christ. Isn't it fascinating that the whole initial attack against the West was against Jesus Christ. Islam was begun as a rejection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Islam was created to attack our Lord, to attack the divin his divinity, and to attack the Trinity. Fascinating. History shows us why it all began. You need to also go to the protocols. And this is, comes out of Yehuda Neville's book that I have here, uh, Islam, uh, the crossroads to Islam, where he looks and he, he follows the, the beginning of the Umayyad Caliphate from the Sufyani period, the Sufyani family from 661 up until 680. And he looked at the protocols because they did write these protocols, these official documents. But they don't mention anything about Islam or about Muslims. They don't mention anything about Muhammad or a book called the Quran or a city called Mecca at all in any of these protocols. 
And then we get to the Marmonid protocols. And this is where the Marmonid family come in. And they come in around 680 with um, Marwan himself, the first. His son, Abdul Malik, then comes to power. And then in 691, the protocols suddenly change overnight. In 691, the protocols change overnight. And now we have the Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim. And when we have al-Muhammad al-Hal al -Hal And then we have the Shahada. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah is then introduced there in 691. And it's introduced overnight. And from that time on, you see the Bismillah and the Shahada then introduced on those protocols. So this is the same time that the Dome of the Rock is being built. Meanwhile, while that's happening, the coins are introduced. Take a look at the coins. We're going to get into this next week, so I'm not going to get, unpack it too much. But when you look at the coins, you will see that there, uh, you, you first have these uh, Byzantine coins, and you can see that they are, they are, have the emperor with the two of his retainers, and then you have the Byzantine cross. When you start looking at uh, those, uh, put uh, the, the, the Sufyani coins, you look at them, you'll notice that there you can see Mu'awiyah holding a cross, which suggests to me that Mu'awiyah was still a Christian. And certainly these coins are still Christian coins. Until you get to Abdul Malik, and then he introduces his image on this coin here in 692, around 692, 693, takes off the image of the cross, takes it off, and is a slap in the face of the Byzantines. And then finally, in 696, introduces the Shahada, the Bismillah, and all these references against Jesus and his divinity. Fascinating. And that's in 696. You need to look at the coins, and you can see the whole sequence of what is going on. We'll get into that next week. Unfortunately, in 689, Petra was destroyed. Destroyed by Ibn Zubair. So a new sanctuary was needed. So he flees from Petra, and he flees from here, and flees possibly down to here, in defiance of the Umayyads and of Petra itself. Now we know something about Mecca because we have an inscription from 697 there. You can see it on the right. Interestingly, this has now been destroyed. In just the last two years, the Arabs, the Saudi Arabians, have destroyed this inscription. You can't find it any longer, I think, because of what we're now finding out about it. It's dated to 697 because it says 72 years after the Hijrah, which is we're going to get into what they mean by the Hijrah, what happened in 622. We'll get into that. And it says that the, it mentions the Masjid al-Haram, which is what Muslims believe is the Kaaba today, the Masjid al-Haram, the place, the forbidden place of bowing, and that it was constructed in Mecca. Wait a minute, a second Masjid al-Haram in 697? I thought that was in Mecca. I thought Mecca was always there. This is a second one? The Abbasids and Zubair, with their sanctuary in Mecca, then demand allegiance from the surrounding tribes. And you can see why they demand allegiance, because they have the black stone. He who has the black stone has God's presence. And that's why all the people start then redirecting their pilgrimages down to Mecca and stop going to Petra, because no longer is God there. He is wherever the black stone is. Mecca was possibly chosen by the rebel Ibn Zubair, and thus from Baghdad and Kufa, the Abbasids, in defiance of the Umayyads and in defiance of Petra. So you have two empires that are competing to create an Arab sanctuary. In 708, the Zamzam well was lost. Uh, so there was a number of years where the first Zamzam well in Petra didn't, did not exist. And then suddenly it reappears in Mecca. In 713, the Umayyads, which are known earlier as the Nabataeans, their sanctuary in Petra was, Petra was completely destroyed by an earthquake. So now by the early 8th century, Petra has nothing to offer anybody. that has no black stone, and it is now physically destroyed by this earthquake. Thus, a new place is needed desperately. Well, we haven't found any mosques facing Mecca that early. In fact, the very first mosque facing Mecca is not till 727. But the Hadith tell us that there were two Meccas. Christian writers speak of the city of Mecca in Paran in Jordan. Thus, could that be the first Mecca? Hold on, we'll talk more about that in four weeks. Now we can see why there are four Qiblas. Why? Well, these two empires are competing for people's allegiance. The earliest Qiblas were facing Petra, had allegiance to the Umayyads in Damascus. All the Qiblas facing Mecca are those who had, who allied themselves with the Abbasids. Two different empires demanding two different allegiances. Al-Hajjaj kills Ibn Zubair, so he cannot rely on Mecca, and it, it is his mosque which face in between the, other, between the other two sanctuaries from 706 onwards, waiting to see who would finally win out in this end of So basically, he was being clever. All the mosques that come under his control, he demands that their Qibla is between Petra and Mecca in a place that no, that, that where nothing exists. 
hedging his bets, waiting to see who is going to finally take over. This is the same idea of those in North Africa and Andalusia. They're not talking with al Hajjaj, but they decide to have parallel mosques. They don't show their allegiance to either empire either, so that they have mosques facing parallel to each sanctuary. Thus, these groups wait to see which side would control before giving their allegiance to either. When the Abbasids finally overpowered the Umayyads in 749, most of the Qiblas then face Mecca with a few holdouts until 822, after which they all face Mecca up to the present time. So these Qiblas were chosen for political purposes, nothing to do with religious expediency. Possible scenario. Here's what of what if. This is what I think is going on. Now that the Muslims have a prophet, Muhammad, a revelation of the Quran, and a sanctuary in Mecca, they then need a history because these were all then created in the 8th century. So they need a history. That's why it's in the early 9th century that a Siddha is finally introduced by Ibn Ishaq. It takes them that much time for the Abbasids to create that Siddha, to create the material, to create their narrative. But it takes another, another 50 years for them to get the Hadith to put together, where al-Buhari is given 600,000 of these. He is told to whittle them down so they all fit the narrative that they want. And that's why he only ends up with 7,397, throws out 98% of it. It takes them another, a good, well, a, a, another 50 more years before the Tafsir is finally written. This is in 923. That's the 10th century. So by the 9th and 10th century, they then now have the book, the man, the place, and the story, and a new religion is formed and growing. Yet this did not take place in a mere 22 years, like Muslims like to tell us, but evolved over a period of two to 300 years. So the story of Petra Mecca is one of political intrigue. An old kingdom of sophistication and amazing engineering feats gives way to a clash of two competing empires, the Umayyads, replaced by the Abbasids. Each has its own sanctuary and its own political capital. Those who lived in the two empires are forced to give allegiance to one or the other, or in some cases both, while others on the fringes remain neutral. As one group rebels and takes the black stone in God's presence to a new location, the balance of power begins to shift. Eventually, that power shift grows and grows until finally the Abbasids wrest power from the Umayyads and create the Islam we now find today. Okay, so there you have it, <laughs> all in one hour. Well, about an hour and uh, three to four minutes. This does not confront the material that Mel and Murad are coming up with and what you'll be soon be hearing from Joe, uh, because that is happening much further north, further over towards the east, northeast, over in places like Baghdad and up further north even in southern uh, Turkey. And those are the, the movement towards Islam or movement uh, that Islam borrowed from, from those much more northern uh, areas, such as the person of Muhammad himself, such as the name Mecca. Whereas Gibson really just looked at how then these Muslims, who then are during the Abbasid era, remember this is the Abbasid Muslims who are headquartered in Baghdad, how they then took much of the Petran antecedents, such as, as we're going to see in the next part of this lecture, the five stages of the Hajj, and then reproduced them in what is today called Mecca. But as far as the tradition surrounding this man Muhammad, as far as who he was, what he did, what he said, and all that, which only began to appear in the ninth century, that person, the name at least, is borrowed from much further north. The place of Mecca, the name itself, is borrowed from much further north as well. And of course, many of the discussions and much of the, the religious discussions is also from much further north. What is interesting also is the Quran comes from much further north. And we're going to be seeing that uh, once we get into the next week's lectures concerning the Qira'at and also concerning the Quran. I hope you're all starting to see it. Maybe it's so confusing for some of you. It should be because we're trying to be as simple as possible. But nonetheless, you have uh, the ability to ask your questions. Just write at the bottom. There are comments there. This is the great thing about putting these up on YouTube. You have the ability to then go and give us your response. Tell us what you think, whether you like it or dislike it. And also try to come up with some type of debates uh, or questions that will get us to 
look one way or the other, or even to respond to you, because that's what we want to do. Terrific. Well, this is the end of that Kibla section, the one part that uh, of Dan Gibson's material. Now we're moving into more uh, concerning what about the antecedents to the Mecca we have today. What about these five stages of the Hajj? That's going to be the second part of this lecture. Stay tuned. Don't go away. It'll be great to see you again. All right. This is Jay. Over and out. <laughs>